uh, New York Times columnist uh, Michelle Goldberg uh, says uh, that uh, 2020 is like uh, 1974, an impeachment crisis, quickly became 1918, a pandemic, turned into 1929, an economic crash, and then became 1968, a massive urban unrest. That's 2020 for you. Uh, it's been a fun ride, hasn't it? And you know that uh, this year has been uh, a different year uh, than all our years uh, that we've really lived, where so much has happened in this short uh, period of time. And uh, I think what we are recognizing as well is the hardship of how challenging it is uh, to live in this world because you know, as uh, Michelle Goldberg says, uh, what we experience is we started off with an, with an impeachment crisis, where in 1974, it was Nixon and, and his Watergate scandal. And for us, uh, for the US, it's Donald Trump. And for here in Korea, uh, there's a lot of other things. And so uh, there's a lot of political turmoil that has led for many of us into dis disillusionment, right? This idea that what's up with the leaders of our nations? Why are they so incoherent? Why can they speak to each other? And then she references 1918. That was the flu pandemic that wiped out a third of the, or that uh, a third of the world's population was infected. And for us here in Korea, uh, it seems that it's worse than ever, right? Uh, it seems like as soon as we get past it, another surge happens. And then she references 1929, the economic crash, which led to the Great Depression. Uh, many uh, economists are forecasting some sort of, of challenging uh, financial times coming up. And then referencing 1968, uh, the massive riots that, that broke out after Do Dr. Martin Luther King uh, was assassinated. And so we've seen glimpses of that as well. And uh, for many people, as I've you know, talked and met with them, they've, they've been wondering, where is God? You know, what's, what's God doing? And I've addressed this a little bit in the past. But the question that we want to address today is in a pandemic, in 2020, in all these hardships when, we, when we're struggling with frustration and anxiety, in this time, for me the question is, can you worship? Can the church can the Christian, in all that is going on, with all the pain, with all the, the bickering of leadership, can you genuinely and sincerely worship? And that's what we're going to be looking into. And what you'll see in Scripture is not only can you sincerely and deeply worship, I would actually challenge you and say, if you cannot, Worship in this pandemic, it may actually say a lot more about your faith than you realize. And the encouragement is for you to understand that in this time, your faith is actually made for this. This is what your faith is made for, for times like this. In this sojourning series, we've talked about several things. Uh, last week, we talked about what it means to be a, a sojourner in the sense that uh, for many of you, you're a Korean at an English-speaking church. Uh, for me, I'm Korean-American living in Korea. It's just that challenge of that cultural displacement. Where is home? Uh, today, this year is a foreign year. right? We've gone through so much. And so with that, the idea is, what is God doing, and how can we actually learn to worship? And what you'll see is that uh, we're actually called to worship God despite the frustration, okay? Despite the frustration, the, the challenges of this life, you are called to worship Him. That's actually the call in 2020. It's been a frustrating year. Has it been a frustrating year? It's been a frustrating year, has it not? If you agree with me, uh, type it down below. It's been a frustrating year, especially if you don't have anyone near you. It's been a frustrating year. You can even you know, give me that fist bump. It's been a frustrating year. It's been so hard, right? 
And it's going to be in light of frustration this uh, psalm comes. Because it starts off first with this call to worship, right? In verse 1, a shout for joy, right? It's, it's, it's give a sound of rejoicing is another way to translate it. Shout for joy in the Lord, O you righteous. Praise befits the upright. Continues on, uh, talking about worshiping. Uh, with instruments, and in verse 3, uh, sing to him a new song. It's placed skillfully on strings with loud shouts. The idea is you don't just uh, sing, but you sing even newly composed songs because you have newly experiences of God's grace. But it could also be singing old songs with a new heart because you've experienced God's grace. And so you're thinking, this call to worship, go worship him, O you Israelites. It's in the context of, oh, God must have just delivered them, right? God must have just done something where they now have experienced God's grace. But look at verse 10. The call to worship comes in the midst of frustration. In verse 10, the Lord brings the counsel of the nations to nothing. He frustrates the plans of the people. It's not in the midst of deliverance and this, this high point. The call is in the frustration. To, the call is to worship Him. And then when you read that verse, you recognize it's God that's doing the frustrating. He frustrates the plans of the people. How many of you are you going through that, right? You're going through something where this year you planned it in a certain way and it's not going in that direction. I mean, I know so many people who are, who are not supposed to be in Korea because they had planned to move somewhere else, but they've halted that plan and they're still in Korea. I know people in Korea who did not plan to be in Korea, right? I met somebody who was planning to be a teaching in the Middle East. And lo and behold, COVID uh, steers them in this direction because that uh, job didn't work out because of COVID. And that's the struggle that all of us are going through. We've planned and we are frustrated. I'm free to acknowledge that God is, doing, God is the one that's doing the frustrating. I'm not saying that God is causing people to sin. I'm not saying that God is causing people to die. What I am saying, though, is God in his providence is behind everything. And once you can see that, that's when you can start to recognize what he is doing. Because for many people, the idea of that verse, God frustrating his people, will be enough to say, well, see, that's why. That's why I don't believe. Because God is like a tyrant. Christopher Hitchens, a well-known atheist who passed away uh, recently, that was one of the main reasons, arguments against Christianity. He would say, when you read the God of the Bible, you recognize that he is a tyrant. I want you to see why God frustrates the plans. It's not because he is a tyrant. It's not because he wants it simply his way. Because if you recognize the reason he frustrates his plans, it's not just for his own glory, but you recognize it's also for the people. It's actually for us. And when you start to, once you start to recognize that, you recognize sometimes there's an opposition of wills where it's actually for the motive of love. And so in verse 11, the counsel of the Lord stands forever. The plans of his hearts uh, to all generations. Talking about his convictions, his deepest desires, his affections, his heart to all generations. And then in verse 12, blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. The people whom he has chosen as his heritage. That's why... He frustrates the plans because he is doing all of this for this work of redemption. And that is a good thing. 
as you recognize all the ways that you're frustrated, when you think about political leaders and you wish you would, that you just wish they would act better, behave better, have better ideas, more humility, more conversation, and you think about what is going on, that's when you recognize this is why God is intervening. Because we cannot save ourselves. And so he has a plan. And though we can't fully understand how it unfolds, he has a plan. And it's his will against our will. And that's why we're frustrated. And if you can understand that, that gives a bunch of insight into what is really going on. And then it, it, it helps us understand even more deeply the cause of our frustration in the following verses. In verse 13, that he sees, he looks down from heaven, he sees, uh, he sees the, the children of man from where he, he sits enthroned, he, work, he looks out and all the inhabitants of the, of the earth. He sees everybody, that's the idea. It's not flippant choices that he's making. He sees all that is going on. And then in verse 15, it gives us a deeper insight into our hearts. Right? He who fashions the hearts of them all and observe all their deeds. He talks about all their deeds. He sees all their deeds, but then he gives us insight into our hearts. That he fashioned them, that he's the maker of our hearts. And that's a critical verse. Because when you see that, you recognize what's, what's happening after this is the cause of our frustration. Right? The king is not saved by his great army. A, a warrior is not delivered by his great strength. Uh, the war ho horse is a false hope for salvation. By its great might, it cannot rescue. This is why we're frustrated, right? Because we put our hopes in illegitimate things. But what he's also saying, though, in verse 15, is that that desire that you have for control, that desire that you have, where you want to be able to have power, to have impact, what God is saying here is your heart, he has created that desire for you to have power, have control, for you to, to have a purpose, to have an impact. That is God's intention. What's gone wrong is that we want too much power. What's also gone wrong is that we've put our hope in illegitimate power to impotent things. Things that are powerless is where we put our hope, right? A king is not saved by his great army. Uh, Tim Keller, when he talks about power, shares a very interesting article that he came across uh, about a meeting that happened in 1923. And it's a meeting that happened at Edgewater Beach Hotel in Chicago, where seven men came together. And these seven men are interesting because these seven men were the wealthiest of all men. And these seven men were so wealthy, they had more money than the entire US, US Treasury. They say that no seven people will ever have so much money uh, either in the past or in the future. And he talks about how this article, as these men came, these seven men, to talk about the future of America. Just in 15 years, these powerful men, three of them commit suicide, two of them are in prison, and two others who are about to die broke, virtually penniless. He goes on in that sermon talking about uh, this quote by John Cheever. The main emotion of, an, of, a, of the adult American who has had all the advantages of wealth, education, and culture is disappointment. That's the main emotion. And using that quote, what I would say is the main emotion for the average privileged person with all the advantages of wealth, education, and culture in 2020 is disappointment. When you've had success in life and you've put your hope in these things, in 2020 what you face is disappointment. Because what you recognize is all the ways in which we want too much power or all the ways 
in which you want illegitimate power. You've put your hope in the strength of your army. You've put your hope in the size of your bank account. You've put your hope in your smarts and your education. And what you're recognizing this year is you really don't have all that power, all the ways that you want to live life and have an impact and have a purpose. You're recognizing you've put your hope in all the wrong things. And so that is why we can worship in 2020. What God is showing us in 2020 is all the ways in which we put our hope in all these illegitimate powers. But as he calls us to worship in the midst of deep frustration, he also then gives us insight. Because the way that we worship right now is not, okay, well then I'm just going to have more faith and work harder. No. He actually guides us and shows us in the midst of deep frustration. It's not about working harder and being better and trying to grit it out and have more faith. What he is saying is learn to have faith in the right kind of power. Specifically, worship God by his word. Worship God by his word. You hear this and you're thinking, really? You're telling me that in 2020, the way, the key to worship is the word? Verse 4. The word of the Lord is upright. Talking about his word has this intention. The best of God's intentions. It's upright and all his work is done in faithfulness. He loves just a righteousness and justice. Verse 5. The earth is full of a steadfast love of the Lord. It talks about who God is but starts off, starts off by saying you find it first in his word. When you see it in his word, then you see it in the world. Verse 6, by the word of the Lord that the, the heavens were made, and by the breath of his mouth all their hosts. Again, you recognize he now goes back to the beginning. It's the word of God that creates the world. Showing them it's, it's in the inherent power of the word. It's, it's in the inherent truth of the word. Once you can see that, that's when you will be able to then truly, sincerely, deeply worship. Because how does God create the world? Many of us, we know it, right? There's a pattern to this. It first says, God said, dot, 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 and then it happens, right? What God says, he does. That's the precedent. That's what the psalmist is saying. What God says, he does. So in verse uh, 3 of Genesis 1, let there be light, and there was light. What God says, He does. You see that what He is doing is helping people understand truly the right way and the only way to know Him. In verse 9 of Psalm 33, it says, For He spoke, and it came to be. He commanded and it stood firm. What God says, He does. It's simple. It's actually the way in which God wants you to know Him. You see, there's two ways to know Him. Uh, there's uh, coming to know Him, coming to the knowledge of Him through deliverance. And God does that. Right? You see it with the Israelites, right? God comes through power, through miracles, through signs, giving the other, the, the Egyptians, these plagues, bringing his Israelites out. And at the Red Sea, what do you see? At the Red Sea, you see the deliverance, the splitting of the Red Sea. And so they come to know God by deliverance. For many of us, that's how we came to know God. We were in a tough spot. We were struggling in life. And he comes through. And you see him, you encounter him, and everything is different. But God, what he does is after the Red Sea, he doesn't take them straight to the promised land. Do you see that? He takes them into the wilderness. Because it's, it's in the wilderness they learn to trust God. They come to know God by his word. You come to know God through deliverance. But that's only the beginning. 
because we have to learn to know God through his word. Once you recognize this, at the Red Sea, it's deliverance. In the wilderness, it's his word. As a sojourner, we are in exile. We are in the wilderness. In the wilderness, in 2020, the way that you will truly, deeply know God is not through the deliverance. It'll happen, but not through the deliverance. In the wilderness, right here, right now, in 2020, the way in which you will know God is not through deliverance. It will be through His Word. A sojourner comes to know God by the truth and the power of His Word. Because it's in the wilderness you're tested. So the sojourner, when they want so many things, when there's so many longings within you, what's going to happen is with all of this, you go to God in His prayer. You go to God in His Word, in prayer. What you find that His Word, what He says, He does. What He says, He does. And so though your circumstances are are not changing in this moment, in this wilderness. What you see is that in this wilderness, His Word is still powerful, it's still true, it's still effective, and He changes your heart and your life. What He says, He does. And it's in the wilderness, that's how you come to know God. The Israelites, they couldn't come to know God. Because why? They were waiting for the promised land. They were so future-minded that they couldn't come and be present where God was. They kept on thinking about the future because they're so future-minded, they weren't present. What we see here is that God, He wants to speak to us. You can miss God's present-day plans because they're so future-minded. Because what he says, he does. So in the, in the, for the Israelites, they see this. In Exodus, they're hungry. Uh, in Exodus 16, they're hungry. They're grumbling. And so God is going to provide for them. But before he does, he says something. Because just like uh, Genesis 1, what he says, he does. I have heard the grumbling of the people of Israel. Say to them, at twilight you shall eat meat. In the morning you shall be filled with bread. Then you shall know that I am the Lord your God. And so they go out, they see the bread, they think, what is this flaky thing? It's in that. God could have just provided. He could have. But he doesn't. He says to them what he's going to do because he wants them to know in the wilderness what I say I do. When our plans are frustrated and you read his word, what happens is he aligns our frustrations, our plans back to Him. In the wilderness, when your hopes are dashed, when you read His Word, your hopes are now aligned back to Him. In your grumbling and in your complaining, when you go into the Word and He rebukes our pride, our lust for power, our lust for control, it's in that humble, quiet rebuke we realize we're satisfied with Him, that He truly is enough. Don't be so so future-minded that you miss God's present-day plans for you. So the question is, how is the church doing with this? How is the church doing with 2020? How would you grade it? If you saw, thought about your own life, how, how are you doing spiritually in 2020? Would you say, oh, that's me. I'm not waiting for deliverance. Right here, 2020, right now, I'm here. Whatever God you say, I'm here. I read your word. I pray. God, I'm here. Is that you? Is that the church? Or is the church somewhere else? Do you think? I think we all know. For most of the church, they're kind of somewhere else. Uh, Barna, a, a couple of months ago, this a Christian uh, research organization, did this study and they found out that about uh, 40% of church people are not attending or watching any live stream. 40%. 40% of church adults for for the past four weeks haven't done anything spiritually. 
And, you know, for them, it's not because, oh, I don't believe in God because of 2020, because of all these things that have, that have happened. No. For them, what is it? Live streaming is hard. Oh, I miss the energy with all the people. Right? That's the struggle, isn't it? And so, you've been a little bit not as engaged. What they also found out is how people are doing with worshiping at home. And the question is, how are you doing? How are you doing worshiping at home? Do you sing along? Do you pray when you pray? Right now, are you, are you really listening to a sermon? Or are you also, you know, doing the dishes? The statistics say about 64% of the church, when they do watch, uh, are praying along. 64%. That's, you know, for many of you teachers, that's failure, right? That's, 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 that's lower than a D. That's an F, right? You're thinking, oh, 64%? Not. No, that's failure, right? How many are worshiping together in, in households? 42%, it says. How many, how many of them are singing? Are you singing at home? 40%. How many of them are multitasking when worshiping? 15%. And that multitasking person either missed that point or they dropped what they're doing, right? <clears throat> I believe the great struggle for 2020 is not that Christians will be so angry and bitter at God that they're turning their backs on Him. I think what's happening is they're just distracted. Live stream is a little bit hard. Oh, it's, there's no energy. Oh, it doesn't feel the same. So they're kind of going through the motions. But how does this psalm start off? It says, shout for joy. Sing with the instrument, with the lyre. There's something that happens when you sing out loud. And I encourage you, no matter how long we're doing this, if we're doing this for 20 years, my hope and prayer is that you, 20 years from now, you click on, hopefully there's better you know, ways that we're doing this, but the idea is, in 20 years, you're still doing church. Because He is everything. His Word is everything. Because it's in that time, yes, there's times when you come to know God through deliverance, but in the wilderness, you come to know God by His Word. What He says, He does. How can we really do that? How can we really do that? At the end of it, it talks about this idea of worshiping God Patiently, worshiping God in the waiting. In verse 20, our soul waits for the Lord. He is our help and our shield. For our heart is glad in Him. And we trust in His holy name. Let your steadfast love, O Lord, be upon us, even as we hope in you. It's beautiful words. I would encourage you to pray these words even this week. He says, in the midst of all the frustration, the Israelites, they're, they're singing this together. They're praying this together. Can we actually read verse 20 together? If you're at home, please read it with me. It says, Our soul waits for the Lord. He is our help and our shield. And imagine, as you said that right now, in all the different homes in which people have just said that, and all the different ways in which God has just spoke to you. Yes, we're not gathered right now, but God, through the Spirit of God, He is doing a good work in our hearts. But you think about how long will this be? Can I do this for that much longer? And it tells us our soul waits. It doesn't say our soul waits for the deliverance. It says our souls wait waits for the Lord. He is our help, our shield, saying, God, whichever way, in your time, my hope is not in how you deliver. It's that one day you will deliver. Until then, and this is the key, verse 21, how do you wait patiently? Our heart is glad in Him. That is how you wait patiently. You don't wait patiently by turning on Netflix. You don't wait patiently by distracting yourself from the pain. You wait patiently by enjoying Him. 
Really, the question is, what's your great hope? Is your great hope for 2021? Or is your great hope right here, right now? God is there. He is listening. He is present. Is that your hope? Is God enough? I mentioned in the beginning what we're doing wrong. The reason we're so frustrated is because we want too much power. Right? We think we should have power, all this power, when in, in reality, we're finite beings. But the other reason we're so frustrated here in 2020, it's because we want illegitimate power. And what these verses actually show us is how to actually understand that power. You see, that power, we see it most clearly in the Israelites, what they didn't do. They grumbled and they grumbled and they grumbled. They wanted this, they wanted that, because they were putting their hope in other things, which, whether it's food for kings, it was the size of their army, it was in the weapons that they had. But what you see, the inverse of that is in the wilderness, not what the Israelites do, it's in the wilderness. What does Christ do? After the baptism of Christ, he's led by the Spirit into the wilderness, being tested for 40 days, Satan there. And what does Satan really do? What's the, what's the temptation that he offers? It's illegitimate power, is it not? It's a shortcut, saying you could have all the kingdoms. And what does Jesus say? No. Because he knew the power that was given to him was going to be through a life of humility, a life of love, a life of obedience, a life submitting himself to death, even death on a cross. And it's in that when you see how ugly the cross is, but you also recognize it's how beautiful it is. What God can do simply through the humility of a person. And it's in God. It's in Christ, his son. He uses that humility to give him full access to real power, where on that day all sin and death is defeated. You see, your desire, your hunger for control, some of it is bad in the sense that you want too much of it. Some of it is bad because you put your hope in illegitimate powers that really only frustrate you because there's no power. But the real way for you to actually live in this pandemic well, is that you put your hope in Him, the one who has all power, the one who has all strength. And it's in that, when you know Him through His Word, that's where the peace comes. That's where the love comes. That's how you can endure 2020 in a way that you can truly, deeply worship Him. Let's pray.